Today, I'm on a quest to witness the genesis of how new ant colonies are born. When conditions are just right, thousands of winged males and females leave their nests and take to the skies to mate in what's called a nuptial flight. Determining exactly when and where a nuptial flight will take place is a complex and inexact science, but luckily, my friend Nami is an expert. He's been on the road a lot lately, catching queens and tracking weather conditions for when different species are going to fly. And today, I get to tag along as we search for the largest carpenter ants in all of North America, Campanotus CaO2. Since carpenter ants are nocturnal, we won't see any out foraging until the sun goes down, but we can locate their nests. Nami is a walking ant encyclopedia, and can often identify the species just by looking at a hole in the dirt. He also has his own site called Antlantis, where you can buy the ants he catches. So we start looking in leaf litter and under logs, but we don't see any signs of them. We did find a colony of termites though, and here you can see one of the soldiers. Unlike ants, termites have a queen and a king to produce all of the workers for their colony. As we continued searching, we spotted a ton of other ant species, like this colony of Myrmecocystis wheeleri, a reddish-orange honeypot ant. Honeypots are the ones with those balloon-like pinatas called repletes that store food and water. Then these harvester ants, who were up to no good, started making trouble in the neighborhood. <clears throat> sorry. A little ways down we found some chromatogasters, also known as valentine ants because of their heart-shaped booties. They also go by acrobat ants because they like to flip that little booty over their head when threatened to spray formic acid onto their enemies, showering them in a painful rain of dissolving chemicals that cause them to scream like the heathens they are. I found this winged elate of an unknown species, and these less common winter ants. These ants are only active during the winter when many other species are going through diapause, which is kind of a dumb strategy because while you do avoid competition with other species, winter is cold and scarce in resources, which is why other species aren't active. As a result, their colonies grow very, very slowly. Unlike these velvety tree ants that Nami pointed out. They would be one of those colonies where it's just gonna blow up, like thousands of workers. So they grow really quickly and they require a lot of food. We even found a queen crazy ant just scurrying along the ground. Crazy ants got their name because they move like a panicked squirrel that lost his nuts, which tracks given how hard she was to record. But with all these species just in this area, it had me asking the question why we would only expect carpenter ants to have a nuptial flight today. The reason we're seeing different things fly at different times is for a multitude of reasons. One is competition, right? So you gotta think, if 30 species all fly at the same time, right, all those queens are gonna have to basically compete for the same amount of resources that are available at that given time period. And for a young colony, that's, it can be really difficult to do, and especially if there's 30 of them that are also competing with other mature colonies. By basically designating certain triggers, I mean, this is how nature has balanced itself out, is different things fly at different times of the year, um, with different other conditions, right? So Campanotus CaO2, for example, flies around this time of year due to heat. There are a lot of factors that go into triggering any given species to fly. Things like time of year, temperature, humidity, rain, wind speed, and even air pressure can play a factor in triggering a nuptial flight. But generally, a good time to look is the day after a rain when the soil is soft. Then we made an exciting discovery. So right here, if you look, you'll see a chamber, probably a honeypot ant. Um, out here, there's Myrmecocystis wheeleri and Myrmecocystis cystaceus. Um, one way to really know that this is probably a queen chamber versus just a regular nest is first, the hole is much larger, and then on top of it, the granules that you see are kind of in a half moon shape, means that she just probably started, probably last night, and then the dirt that's following accompanying it, if you look, is really oval-like, much larger. Regular workers can't carry that. They need to be able to do that so they can dig much faster and deeper because the time that they have in terms of getting away from predators is much shorter. Nami explained that the amount of dirt outside the hole can tell you how deep she's burrowed. For this one, he said I should dig about three to four inches, something I failed to do on my first try. Then the best technique is to spread the dirt out evenly, something I also failed to do here. Then it's a matter of sifting through the dirt to find the queen. 
But as I quickly learned, just because you found a chamber does not mean that you found a queen. Many chambers are raided by predators, like this camel spider, because an unprotected queen is an easy meal without the risk of an angry colony coming after you. The second chamber we found I did much better. Three to four inches down, spread the dirt, find the queen. I want to point out that we're only digging up queens on the trail. Not just because they're more convenient and easier to spot, but also because these queens are not as likely to succeed. It's right in the path of human foot traffic, and because they're so exposed, the chambers are more easily spotted by us and by predators. It's also important that we cover up the holes we dig. We want to leave nature the way that we found it and not create scars. After digging up several empty chambers with no luck, we finally spotted one. Myrmecocystus testaceus, also known as the brick honeypot ant. And this one is special, because she is the first queen I've ever caught myself. She's got a dark body with light brown legs and amber colored hairs on her abdomen. We put her in a capsule and kept looking. When a species decides to have a nuptial flight, there can be thousands of newly mated queens in that area, all looking for a suitable place to start their own colony. After digging up a few more chambers, I found a second queen. This was very exciting because my other colony of honeypot ants named the gumdrops had a series of die-offs, leaving just the queen, which usually means that the colonies failed. So getting another chance to get a honeypot colony started is a dream come true. After filling in the hole, it was time to move on. The sun was starting to go down, which means it was nearing the time when carpenter ants start to fly. So we hiked back to the trailhead and strapped on our headlamps. That was about the time we met Francisco, who showed up also looking for queen ants. So the three of us set off down the trail together in search of Campanotus CaO2. We encountered so many creatures, it was like real life Pokemon. We were just three nerds on a nighttime safari. Oh, and then Nami's friend Brad showed up. We were just four nerds on a nighttime safari talking about ants, insects, and animals. Apparently, Francisco is also a beetle enthusiast and got really excited when we came across some rotting wood. Like, grab a bag, I'm taking this all home excited. And then we spotted them. Carpenter ants. Tons of them. And they were huge. This is an average size worker. And this is a super major, truly an impressive monster of an ant. My own colony of CaO2, the minions of Midas, have been hibernating in a wine fridge for the winter. A couple weeks ago, it was time to wake them up. But unfortunately, they didn't make it. At some point in the last couple months, the temperature of the fridge got too cold. It was an honest mistake, and if I had been checking on them periodically, I probably could have saved them before it was too late but I am determined to raise a healthy colony of these magnificent carpenter ants, which is why I'm out looking for new queens. And hopefully, all of the mistakes I've made on this channel will help some of you avoid the same missteps with your own colonies. Unfortunately, we didn't see any with wings, which means they decided not to fly today. Even though the conditions seem perfect, nature follows her own schedule. But before we left, I found one last honeypot queen crawling along the ground, which I collected. Even though we didn't find what we came for, I still had an amazing day. I walked away with three new honeypot queens, saw a ton of amazing wildlife, and spent time with some great people. After all, the best part of an adventure isn't the destination, but the surprises along the way. Like my new honeypot queens, whose journeys are just beginning, as the story of the ants marches on. If you enjoyed this story, go ahead and hit the like button and check out some of my other videos. Thanks for watching.